Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone I am Dr G C Poonima professor and head department of anatomy Mysore Medical College and Research Institute Mysore Today I am going to discuss about the thalamus so before going into the discussion of the thalamus let us go for a case study a 16 year old girl was taken by a mother to a pediatrician because she was rapidly losing weight and her eating habits had changed her personality also changed and after eating she forced herself to vomit on examination there were signs of weight noticeable weight loss with hollow facial features cold extremities and low blood pressure the case was diagnosed as anorexia nervosa so the objective of studying the hypothalamus is to describe the boundaries parts gross relation major nuclei connections of the hypothalamus epithalamus metathalamus and subthalamus describe the connection of the hypothalamic nuclei with the pituitary gland and discuss the clinical anatomy of hypothalamus epithalamus metathalamus and subthalamus so hypothalamus is a part of diencephalon which is below the thalamus this is where we see the thalamus so below the thalamus below the sub so hypothalamic sulcus we see a hypothalamus anatomically it weighs about 4 grams and per 0.3% of the total brain weight physiologically there is hardly any part of the body which is not influenced by the hypothalamus so the size and function is just appropriate it is called as a head ganglion of the autonomic nervous system so the boundaries it is ventral to the thalamus so this is the thalamus ventral this is the hypothalamic sulcus this part is the thalam hypothalamus so what are the boundaries of the hypothalamus superiorly is the hypothalamic sulcus anteriorly is the lamina terminalis then posteriorly it continues with the tegmentum of the midbrain and inferiorly we have the opticasma the tubocinerium the infundibulum and the mammillary body so within this boundaries encloses the hypothalamus then we have the subdivision the hypothalamus is this is the hypothalamus is divided into number of regions or zones by the two lateral halves by the cavity of the third ventricle for conventional teaching purpose it is actually studied as a single structure but basically it is a bilateral structure the anterior column of the fornix this is a fornix which you see traverses the hypothalamus to reach the mammillary body dividing the hypothalamus into medial and lateral zone the mammillo thalamic and the fasciculus retroflexes also lie in the same plane the hypothalamus is divided into number of regions where the hypothalamic nuclei is being present so this is a preoptic region the supraoptic region this is the tubero infundibular region and this is the mammillary region thus it is divided into three or four regions within this regions lays the optic nerve optic uh, pre optic nuclei then in the supra optic region you have the posterior nucleus paraventricular nucleus and the supra optic nuclei in the tubero ventricular uh, sorry tubero infundibular region we have the dorso medial and ventro medial nucleus and lower down just above the infundibulum you have the arcuate nucleus then in the mammillary region we have the posterior nucleus and the mammillary 
body. So, these are all the hypothalamic nuclei and what are its important connections? The afferents and efferents it receives is discussed next. So, the hypothalamus, the lines of communications, it receives and gives the information from the rest of the body through either through the nervous connections or the bloodstream or the cerebrospinal fluid. The neurons of the hypothalamic nuclei respond and exert their controls via the same routes. The CSF may act serve as a conduit between the neurosecretory cells of the hypothalamus and distant sites of the brain. So, the afferent connections of the hypothalamus can be from three groups. It is from the brain stem or descending fibers from the forebrain can relay in the hypothalamus and information conveyed through the blood vessels. The mammillary peduncle is one which conveys the sensory impulses from the spinal cord and the brain stem basically carrying the gustatory and the general visceral sensations. The next important fiber is the medial forebrain bundle is a major pathway of the hypothalamus which connects the hypothalamus with autonomic and limbic structures. It also has a friend connection, the thalamus, the globus pallidus and the subthalamus. The efferents of the hypothalamus are the mammalothalamic tract. It is from the mammillary body to the thalamic nuclei. It can be the reticular nucleus of the thalamus or the centromedian nucleus or the ventrolateral and ventrolateral or the dorsomedial nucleus. It forms its connections. The mammalotegmental with a part of the reticular formation of the midbrain, it is the efferent connection. Then the descending fibers to the brainstem and spinal cord are the efferents of the hypothalamus. Then to the reticular formation, it is connected to the parasympathetic nuclei of the 3rd, 7th, 9th and 10th cranial nerves of the brainstem. It also has efferent from the preganglionic sympathetic neurons of the lateral horn T1 to T2, L2 spinal segments and also from the preganglionic parasympathetic neurons to the lateral horn of S2, S3 and S4, also the efferent connections with the fornix. The efferent also is connected to the pituitary gland through two tract that is the hypothalamo hypophyseal tract. The, so the hypothal hypothalamus has two nuclei that is the supraoptic hypophyse and paraventricular nucleus is being present. So, it forms what you call it as a supraoptico hypophyseal tract is being formed. So, these secrete the, what you call it as neurosecretions. The neurosecretions are different from neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters are the acetylcholine, the epinephrine and non-epinephrine. But the neurosecretions are secreted and it is conveyed through the axons of these nucleus, paraventricular and supraoptic nuclei. And then it is conveyed into the posterior part of the pituitary gland. Here it is stored as a herring bodies. This is surrounded by the lush of blood capillaries or sinusoids. So, as and when the body needs it, the these the epiphy herring bodies will release these so secretions which are basically the ADH and oxytocin hormones directly into the blood vessels. So, this is the neurosecretions that is being released by the hypothalamo hypophyseal tract from these two nuclei of the hypothalamus. This is how it maintains its connection, the efferent connections with the posterior part of the pituitary gland. The next one is the hypothalamo hypophyseal portal system. So, the pituitary gland has two sets of uh, portal plexus that is formed at the infundibulum at the anterior pituitary gland is being formed. 
which is basically formed by the superior hypophyseal artery, the veins of that form the first primary capillary plexus, the inferior forms the uh, hypophyseal veins form the secondary capillary plexus within the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland. So, again the nuclear components of the not only of the supraoptic and paraventricular, but all other com nucleus that is the in the tubero infundibular region, the nucleus that is being present that is the posterior nucleus, the dorsomedial, the dorsoventral part is being released. So, they will communicate through the primary and capillary plexus, the primary capillary plexus and then it has a releasing and inhibiting factors that is being released into the uh, anterior pituitary. So, if it is inhibiting factors, it inhibits the secretions of the following hormones that is stored in the cells of the anterior pituitary lobe that is the parts anterior or it can be releasing factors also. This is controlled by the tubero infundibular tract of the hypothalamus. So, the cells are which secrete the hormones and controlled by this tract are the follicular stimulating hormone, the luteinizing hormone, the adenogonado, um, the adenocortico hormone, the prolactin and the growth hormone. So, that is the way the the hypothalamus through its nuclear complexes control both anterior and posterior, but in two different ways. The summary till now we have the hypothalamus region, which is a part of the ventral thalamus, the, uh, the part of the diencephalon divided by the hypothalamic sulcus, which has two parts the hypothalamus and the subthalamus. This is the pars dorsalis which has the thalamus proper, the <coughs> epithalamus and the metathalamus. The hypothalamus has got the following nucleus in the following regions that is a preoptic nuclei, then we have the anterior nuclei, supraoptic paraventricular nuclei and supraoptic nuclei. We have in the tubero infundibular region, you have the dorsomedial and ventromedial nucleus. Then in the mammillary region, we have the posterior nucleus and the mammillary body is being present. So, in the next part of our discussion, we have the functions of the hypothalamus. It plays a very important role in controlling the many functions of the vital or the organ. So, for the vital survival of the organ. So, all the most of the functions it is controlled by the hypothalamus. So, when we come to the endocrine functions, where it has a direct effect on the releasing and inhibiting hormones on the anterior pituitary. The neurosecretion from the supraoptic and paraventricular for the release of the vasopressin and oxytocin. The anterior and medial it has in the group it has preoptic and supraoptic nuclei which is controls the parasympathetic activity the entire body on the cardiovascular system, on the respiratory system and on the gastrointestinal system. So, they can be diminished heart rate, a fall in the blood pressure, constriction of the pupil and the increased paralysis. So, the posterior and lateral part has a sympathetic effect. So, there is enough of the same organs on the cardiovascular, the respiratory system and the gastrointestinal system. There is an increased heart rate, the respiratory rate and dilatation of the pupil and diminished motility of the GIT secretions. So, these are some of the functions of the hypothalamus. So, the hypothalamus not only control, it also controls the food and water intake by the laterally and medially placed nucleus. This is called as the satiety center, where there is a satisfaction of after consuming the food or the water intake is also being controlled by the hypothalamus. 
it also has a function in controlling the sexual behavior of an individual and through the anterior pituitary the reproduction is also controlled this is to the tuberal region the circadian rhythm of the biological clock the cyclical rhythm is been of the uh, body is for 24 hours is managed by the hypothalamus the various expressions of emotions fear rage aversion pleasure and reward are some of the <coughs> emotional fear this thing which is controlled by the hypothalamus so thermoregulation the rise in the body temperature and the hypothermia and hypothermia is controlled by the anterior and posterior nucleus of the hypothalamus so these are some of the functional so the overall all the functions of the body is controlled by the hypothalamus the next is a blood supply hypothalamus is region which is supplied it is in the submerged part of the cerebral cortex so <clears throat> the arterial supply will be from the anterior cerebral artery the middle cerebral artery and posterior cerebral artery which gives central branches cortical branches and choroidal branches so the anterior part of the hypothalamus the central branches of anterior medial group of anterior cerebral artery is supplying whereas the posterior part sub of the central branches of the posterior medial group from the posterior cerebral and posterior communicating artery is supplying the hypothalamus the lesions now coming to the various lesions of the nucleus and how it is affecting is the next part of the discussion if there is a lesion in the preoptic nucleus there can be sexual dimorphism with a irregular menstrual cycle and loss of libido the anterior nucleus there is heat loss center then there is hypothermia hyperthermia of the body the posterior nucleus there is a heat ray center which is hypothermia the lateral nucleus is the hunger center is where if it's affected it leads to anorexia and emaciation the medial nucleus is a satiety center which affected leads into obesity the mammillary body which is mainly for the recent memory the verniques encephalopathy then the supra optic nucleus the adh has been released if it's affected leads to a condition of diabetes insipidus so these are all the various nuclear lesion how it can be represented and what are the effects on the body is been noted so the next coming back to the case study which we had represented which we had presented in the earlier part of the discussion uh, we will discuss about that case the 16 year girl was taken by a mother to the pediatrician because she was rapidly losing weight her eating habits had altered her personality also changed after eating she forced herself to vomit so what are the signs of the weight loss was noticeably seen with hollow facial features extremities were very cold with a low blood pressure the case was diagnosed as anorexia nervosa so what we have here which are the nuclear component that is been affected the eating center here lesion has been occurred so when we go back to this slide we have the lateral nucleus which is the hunger center so this is suppressed there is a lesion over here leading into a condition called as anorexia and then the suppression of the medial nucleus the medial nucleus is not so this thing so the main effect will be the lateral nucleus lesion as occurred leading into the condition of anorexia and also the cold extremities hypothermia is also been seen in that case so leading into the changes in the temperature regulation and low bp was this thing so the case was diagnosed as anorexia nervosa 
The next is the clinical anatomy is the diabetes insipidus where there is an impaired secretion of the antidiuretic hormone because of the lesions in the supraoptic and paraventricular tract. It are, features are polyuria where the large amount of urine is passed with a low specific gravity and polydipsia because of the increased water intake. Then there is another condition called as craniopharyngioma, which is a congenital tumor from the remnants of the Rathke pouch. It is a supratentorial tumor in children. It is a benign tumor which compresses the optic chasma and the hypothalamus. It represents as a bilateral hemianopia with due to the pressure on the optic chasma. The various hypothalamic syndromes are present like the weight gain where there is obesity because the medial nucleus has been affected. So, there is no control in eating leading into obesity. The thermoregulation center, the medial and lateral nucleus is also being affected. So, there is a disturbance in the thermo temperature regulation. So, what we have here is the hypothalamus which is a part of the diencephalon. These are the following nucleus that is being present, the preoptic nucleus, the supraoptic paraventricular and the anterior nucleus. Then we have the medial dorsal and posterior dorsal and archaeate nucleus, the, the posterior nucleus and the mammillary nucleus or body. These are the nuclear components of the hypothalamus. The next one is the effect of the hypothalamus nuclei, especially the tuberoinfundibular region. This region, the nucleus, is affecting the anterior pituitary vessel. It has secreted, it releases the releasing inhibiting factors and the releasing factors from these nuclei and controls the secretion of the hormones from the anterior pituitary. Then we have the the supraoptic and paraventricular nucleus which controls to the hypothalamic hypophyseal tract controls the release the neurosecretions which are stored in the herring bodies at the end of the axons of these nuclei and it is directly released into the blood vessels. So, this is about the hypothalamus, the nuclear component and how it has got an different important connections with the pituitary and overall mm, functions affecting the whole functions of the body. So, it is an important autonomic nervous system, integral part of the limbic system, maintains the water balance, regulates the thirst and heating behavior and also the gastrointestinal tract motility and it maintains the body temperature and the activity of anterior pituitary gland. The neuroendocrine cells of the hypothalamus control the pituitary gland through the hypophyseal hypothalamic tract through the secretions of antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin. So, the next part of the discussion is a metathalamus. So, this is a part of the dorsal thalamus. It are the rounded elevation. This is the thalamus which is present in the posterior part of the posterior most part of the thalamus. The pulvinar part continues over here. There are two rounded elevation that is present. This is a part of the dorsal thalamus. They are the third and fourth order neuron. So, relay stations for visual and auditory impulses. So, this is the lateral geniculate body and this is the medial geniculate body. So, this medial geniculate body is the aggregation of neurons act as a third order neurons for the auditory pathway. So, from the superior cellar olivary nucleus which is situated in the pons and medullum. So, the, the axons from here are relayed in the inferior colliculus from here and also the fibers of lateral lemniscus which contains the crossed fibers. 
then it is relayed both the fibers are relayed in the inferior colliculus which forms the one uh, the second order neurons of the auditory pathway from here the axons of the inferior colliculus through the inferior brachium is relayed in the medial geniculate body so the axons from the medial geniculate body it becomes a third sometimes we call it as a fourth order neuron of the ascending pathway of the auditory pathway and it is relayed in the temp superior temporal lobe of the cerebral cortex area number 41 and 42 through the thalamus called as the acoustic radiation so this is where the medial geniculate body is situated forming one of the order of the neurons in the ascending pathway of the auditory impulses so here it starts as a spiral the cochlear nerve is being formed from the internal here so this will relay in the spiral and finally comes in the medulla to relay in the superior olivary the nucleus which is at the ponto medullary junction from here the ascending tracts begins as a lateral meniscus they can be crossed and uncrossed fibers passing through the midbrain relays in the inferior colliculus at the level of the midbrain then the fibers from here relay in the medial geniculate ganglion which is situated in the posterior most aspect of the thalamus and then relayed in the primary auditory cortex of area number 41 and 42 so this is where the medial geniculate body is present and this is its important role then the lateral geniculate body that is seen it is also part that is seen in the posterior most aspect of the thalamus behind the pulvinar it is made up of the neurons are arranged here in six layers so the six layers is what <clears throat> the uh, it receives the crossed and uncrossed fibers from the retina so and the optic tract so this is the optic chiasma then the optic tract is formed the optic tract contains the uncrossed and crossed fibers of the opposite side and it is relayed in the lateral geniculate body the lateral geniculate body which has six layers the uncrossed fibers relay in the second third and fifth layers whereas the crossed fibers relay in the first four and sixth layers so the main function is to so the in different quadrants so the peripheral retina is relayed so this peripheral part of the retina in the medial part and and the lower quadrant is in the lateral part the efference from the lateral geniculate body is projected into the primary visual cortex which is the area number 17 so this is a lateral geniculate body the optic tract so the from the retina these are the fibers they are coming so it finally goes into the optic radiation through the thalamus as a um, uh, optic radiation into the so cerebral cortex of uh, occipital lobe area number 17 so the summary so this is the medial and lateral geniculate bodies acts as a relay station for auditory and visual pathway then we come to the next part of the discussion is the epithalamus it is situated in the posterior boundary this is the third ventricle so this is the posterior part of the third ventricle so the what are the components of the epithalamus it is a part of the dorsal thalamus this is a hypothalamic sulcus the thalamus so dorsal thalamus it becomes a part of that so these are the components that is seen that is the habenular commissure the pineal gland and the posterior commissure so these are the constituents of the epithalamus so what are the functions part of this the, uh, ep ep the epineal gland is also called as the epiphysis cerebri this is a pineal gland that is situated sorry this is the thalamus that is been seen so it is a midline cone shaped reddish gray structure which is about 3 to 5 mm between the superior 
colliculus below the splenium of the corpus callosum. The entire body is 8 millimeters. It has two stalks, superior and inferior, and the third ventricle recess enters into the pineal gland as a pineal recess it is formed. The two stalks, which is superior, are continuing with the posterior and the habenular commissures. So, this is where the pineal gland is being present is a cone shaped structure that is seen. So, in the lower animals it is presented by two parts an anterior part and a posterior part. The anterior part is called as a pineal eye or the parietal eye. The posterior is a glandular part. But in humans the posterior part is persistent the parietal eye has disappeared. It is a neuroendocrine gland made up of parenchymal cells that is the pineulocytes and the neuroglial cells with a rich network of blood vessels. It receives the nerve supply from the postganglionic sympathetic fibers which arise from the superior cervical ganglion. So, the main function of the pineal gland is being basically poorly understood. But in the recent investigation, it is shown to have a neuroendocrine function. It exerts its influence on the preoptic and hypothalamic neurons on through the CSF or through the blood vessels. It is antigonotrophic in function, suppresses the gonadal development before puberty by inhibiting the gonadotrophic releasing hormone from the anterior pituitary. But after puberty, this pineal gland involutes and the gonadal development starts. This gland uh, by various in recent investigation, it is shown the influenced by the light because the anti-gonadotrophic activity is highest in the dark and lowest when exposed to light. So, in this gland functions, there is a neuronal input which is exogenous factor such as the light to the endogenous glandular factor where it releases the hormones. So, the hormones released by the pineal gland is the mel melanotonin. The other part of the pineal gland is the habenula nucleus, which is a small group of neuron situated in the posterior and medial aspect of the thalamus. It receives afferents from the amygdaloid body, hypothalamus and hippocampus, gives efferents to the interpeduncular nucleus. Some fibers of the stria medullaris thalamus cross the midline and reach the opposite habenular nucleus, thus forming the habenular commissure. The main function of the commissure with the nucleus and its connection forms a part of the limbic system, whereas the basic emotional drives. So, the habenular commissure connects the two habenular nuclei passing through the superior stalk of the pineal gland. It acts as a nodal point for the convergence of the basic emotional drive and sense of smell. So, the posterior commissure is a composite group which forms a part of the inferior stalk of the pineal gland. Composite bundles of fibers connects the longitudinal, medial longitudinal fibers, interstitial nuclei of kajal, superior colliculus, pretectile nuclei and the two posterior thalamic nuclei of both the sides. The main function of this posterior commissure is a consensual pupillary reflex. So, clinical anatomy of this epithalamus in this region, lesions of the pineal gland can lead into precocious puberty. Sometimes there is a calcification of the pineal gland is demonstrated radiologically because it will start involuting before the onset of puberty. So, that is why it gets calcified sometimes. It is useful to identify the shadow of pineal gland 
to de detect the shift in the brain structures from midline due to some space occupying lesion. So, this point becomes very important. If the posterior commissure is involved, then it leads to a decreased consensual pupillary reflex. So, the summary in the hypothalamus, epithalamus includes the pineal gland, the hebanula nucleus, the com hebanula commissure, the posterior commissure which lay in relation to the posterior part of the roof of the third ventricle. The other part is the subthalamus. It is a structure is very complex. It is a part of the ventral. It is also called as a ventral thalamus. So, this is the subthalamic nucleus that is present. It is between the thalamus and the tegmentum of the midbrain, medial to the internal capsule and globus pallidus. This nucleus is a biconvex mass of grey matter situated dorsolateral to the red nucleus and ventral to the zona inserta. This is a site for the integration of motor activity. So, the zona inserta is a part is a thin lamina of grey matter which is seen in the within, in front of the subthalamic nuclei. Laterally, this zona inserta continues with the reticular nucleus of the thalamus. So, what is the grey matter and the white matter? It is basically the cranial end of the red nucleus and substantia nigra extend into the subthalamic nuclei and the zona inserta, the white matter that passes through the subthalamic nuclei are the cranial ends of all the lemniscus that is uh, coming from the midbrain. Then the dentothalamic fibers and rubrothalamic fibers are also passing through it. So, it forms ansa lenticularis and fasciculus lenticularis together forming the subthalamic fasciculus. So, the lesions is basically concerned with the motor, it is a relay tension, most of the motor activity is controlling. So, the lesion in the subthalamic nuclei is called as hemibalismus. It is an irregular movement of the trunk, girdles and both the limbs are involved. The subthalamus has an inhibitory effect on the globus pallidus. So, the summary of the subthalamus, it is a nucleus receiving fibers from the globus pallidus, from the red nucleus and then relayed into the reticular nucleus of the thalamus, thus controlling the motor activity from the red nucleus, the globus pallidus and also the dentate nucleus which is finally getting relayed in the thalamus and overall bringing about the motor integration. Thank you.